I've been forewarned that I have to keep this as short as myself. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I've written 100 years after the Caledon lockout because, in effect, it wasn't really a Soviet, even though it was inspired by the money, the Monaghan Asylum Soviet, because the, the workers were actually, actually locked out. They did form their own uh, sort of police force, but that was more to, to stop them from getting attacked by the police than anything else. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this area, as a young working class, person from a Republican background in Ghana, and I didn't think I'd ever be given a talk uh, about a Soviet or a lockout in Caledon. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the Freeman's Journal at the time said that Caledon uh, came to fame as an herbs intacta, which is, you know, an unbreached stronghold of oranges and where no dog barks unless the tune is Dolly's Bray. All right. And there was a, an American anthropologist called uh, William Kelleher, and he wrote a book, uh, the Troubles in Bolly Boggan, and after reading three pages, I realised that Bolly Boggan was Dungannon. And that the place that the people in Dungannon referred to as Caledon was, it's a black hole, they described the people there as bitter and antagonistic to Catholics, but they were pretty antagonistic to Protestants in the book itself. What we're going to talk about today is an episode which is essentially reflective of a trend within history, what E.P. Thompson would call the enormous condescension of posterity, or what Walter Benjamin would called the history written by the winners where ordinary people lay prostrate and a procession of the victors of history. In fact, Calvin, for a very, very brief period, reflected Thomas Davis's very famous line, then let the orange lee be a badge, my patriot brother, the orange for you, the green for me, and each for one another. Now, what I'll do is I'll try and locate this uh, lockout or the, the, the strike, the six week strike in Calvin, within the context of labor militancy in Ulster very, very briefly up until 1919. We then look at the Caledon lockout itself, and then we locate it in what Connolly very famously called the Carnival of Reaction, which was instituted because of the consolidation of partition. We look at the counter-revolution in Caledon, how a town where Protestants and Catholics were parading with a big long big drum and a red flag in 1919. By 1922, there's very consolidated and serious intercommunal and sectarian violence in Caledon, which is reflective really of the way that both states were consolidated after partition, and then I'll maybe finish with a uh, most labour weight. We'll see what we have to learn from Caledon. So what is labour militancy in Ulster in 1917 and 1919? Caledon, in many respects, is typical and atypical of what's going on in Ulster between 1917 and 1919. It's atypical because the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union are involved, but it's very typical because this period witnesses a massive amount of trade union militancy. If you look at the Mid-Ulster area, North Throne, 
uh, North uh, Armagh, East Tyrone, up in the Mid Ulster, you will see that independent Labour Party members representing you know, uh, British Union, amalgamated British Union for un unknown skilled workers called the Workers Union, uh, organised and helped facilitate a range of very, very militant strikes in this area. In fact, there was far more Labour militancy in places like East Tyrone in 1919 than there was overtly constitutional agitation like the Irish Volunteers or the UVF or anything like that. In fact, for a very, very brief window, it appeared that there was the beginnings of something that could be called a social revolution. Now, it doesn't last very long, and it's stomped down primarily from uh, the unionist side, but also it's this stomped down and this repression is facilitated on the nationalist <coughs> side as well. But the, the people who, who carry this out are uh, what you could call the inheritors of the tradition of James Connolly and Belfast. These are a grouping of people who were uh, involved in the Independent Labour Party, who were involved in the, the Belfast Trades Council, and essentially leave Walkerism with its uh, attention to British Unionism and adopt the Connolly position, an anti-partitionist socialist position. And Connolly very famously said himself about partition, he says that it would uh, mean a carnival of reaction both north and south, would set back the wheels of progress, would destroy the oncoming unity of the Irish labour movement and paralyse all advanced movements while it endured. And the argument here by revisionist historians, people like Peter Hart, would be that a social revolution was never even in prospect in Ireland. But if we look at the people in Belfast and across Ulster in this period between 1917 and particularly 19, up until 1920, we actually see that there were very serious attempts were made to mobilise people in terms of class-based analysis of Irish history, anti-partitionist, class-based, and in favour of uh, socialism. Now, what happened was, and we are not be able to see the, the bottom of this, is that while some very, very uh, important work was done, while uh, the particularly Labour movement in Belfast, the people who stood as independent Labour uh, candidates in the 1918 general election, that the Labour movement generally uh, in Ireland didn't fully incorporate itself into the National Revolution or didn't stand on its own two feet. It kind of sat on the fence and Pot O'Donnell himself says that whenever Sinn Féin was founded in October 1917, nobody noticed that Connolly's chair was left vacant. That the place Connolly purchased for the organised Labour movement in the independent struggle was being denied. And this is uh, really at the very heart of what happens to the great potential, arguably, that existed in Belfast and across Ulster in this period from 1917 until 1919, until essentially the onset of uh, the shipyard expulsions and the consolidation of the northern and the southern state. Now, who are these people who carried all this uh, activity in places like Dungannon and Cookstown and Cull Island. They're all members of the Workers' Union. They're all leading socialists from Belfast. They're typically all Protestants. Dawson Gordon, for those of you who haven't uh, written it, Dawson Gordon is, is the, or read my book. Dawson Gordon is essentially the, the representative of the Workers' Union. He's a Belfast Protestant socialist. He is elected during the uh, local government elections in January 1920, the City Hall, where uh, independent Labour went between 10 and 12 seats, which is double what nationalism and republicanism win. And people like Dawson Gordon, Campbell, Sam Kyle spend an awful lot of time not just organising labour in Belfast, but going out into the countryside and organising unskilled workers in rural Ulster. And uh, in 1920, just before the pogrom, an American journalist, a female journalist called Russell, tours Ireland and interviews Dawson Gordon. And she writes a brilliant book for what, called What's the Matter with Ireland? I'm sure some of you have al uh, already read it. And Gordon outlines why this sort of brief flourishing of militancy takes place in Ulster. And the first thing is p p ordinary people's material conditions. He says, pay is not the only thing. Working conditions are another. Go to the mills and see uh, the sweat that should be, the, the wet spinners. The air of the room they work in is heavy with humidity. There are women, waist open at the throat, sleeves rolled up, hair pulled back to prevent the irritation of loose ends and damp skin, bare feet on the cement floor. We got out of the road. At noon, they snatch up their shawls and rush home for a hurried lunch. It's not surprising that poor working conditions were responsible for many premature births, many delicate children, nor that the low pay of the workers made them easy prey to tuberculosis. Why such pay and working conditions, Gordon asked, because before the war, there were only 400 of us organised, and that's in Belfast. But those conditions would have been typical of mills throughout Ulster. Now, th th this is G Gordon's analysis of what's going on. That's actually the handle of the... Jug. <laughs> I thought it was a cable. Okay. 
Gordon says, When I was small, I believed anything I was told about Catholics. I remember this tale that my mother repeated to me as she said her grandmother had told to her. A neighbour was alone in her cabin one night. There was a knock at the door. A Catholic woman begged for shelter. The neighbour could not bear to turn her back into the night. Then, as there was only one bed, the two women shared it. Next morning, grandmother heard a moaning in the cabin. On entering, she saw the neighbour lying alone on the bed, stabbed in the back. The neighbour's last words were, Never trust a Catholic. As I grew a little older, I found two other Protestant friends whose grandmothers had had the same experience. <laughs> and since I have been a labour organiser, I have run across Catholics who told the same story turned about. So I began to think that there was a hell of a lot of great-grandmothers with stabbed friends. <laughs> Almost too many for belief. And what he says is, but historical, uh, historical as they were, such story, stories served their purpose of division. And we'll actually see some ridiculous stuff from the MP for this area, William Coote, about this. Now, Gordon's experience is that ordinary workers began to become conscious of their own material conditions at the end of the war, and this was the material basis really for this labour militancy. He said, typically before the war, no sooner would such a speaker, a, a, a socialist, raised off the platform than there would be calls from all parts of the house, are you Sinn Féinar, what's your religion, or do you vote unionist? There was no way out he had to declare himself, then one or the other half of his audience would rise and leave. With low wages, of course, the workers could not get a perspective of their battle. Then came the war. Okay? And the difference, the shortfall between the inflation during the war and the boom and the profit here and then went on and the way that wages were suppressed. And the difference says that workers had to get the difference. They couldn't without organisation. With hunger at their heels, they forgot prejudices. Catholics began, began to go to meetings in orange halls. Protestants attended similar meetings in Ibernian assembly rooms. At a small town near Belfast, there was a recent labour procession. And he might be talking... Uh, but somewhere in North Armagh, in which one half of the bond was orange and the other half Hibernian. And you see this again and again across rural Ulster. And this is the backbone of the support that these people get in the 1918 general election. Four independent Labour candidates ignore the Irish Labour Party's abstention, stand in typically Protestant working class areas and gain between 20 and 25% of the vote. They also secured between 10 and 12 seats in the local government election of 1920. There is a considerable element, I would argue, particularly amongst non-skilled or unskilled Protestant workers who are receptive to a socialist, non-sectarian and anti-partitionist message and that the machinations on one side of the unionist establishment and then the, 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 essentially the failure of the labour movement uh, based in Dublin to properly ch uh, integrate themselves into the national struggle and Sinn Féin's quite agnostic position on class politics leads to this uh, upspringing of labour militancy withering on the, the vein and actually being quite... Uh, forcibly suppressed. So how, where does this happen? And you can't see this right, but you will, if you can't see it at all, you notice who the employer is there. He's the person at the front row who's twice the size of everybody else. This, is, uh, this is, starts off in Kalayland in 1917, all right, where the workers' union, these Belfast boys come down in conjunction with a man called Neil O'Donnell, who's a local workers' union organiser, and they strike in uh, the spinner's mill and the spoke mill, I'll not go into every single detail, but essentially what happens is you get a wave of strikes that begin, first of all, with demands for higher wages. And this is what happens across Ulster and across Ireland really, but particularly in Ulster from 1917 onwards, you get a wages movement. Because the three strikes in Kaleyland are successful, Gordon then organises a meeting in George's Hall. George's Hall, I think, is the top of Milltown in Ogannon. Both Catholics and Protestants attend the meeting in George's Hall and Gordon says, a period in history, this they are living in, some people when nothing else could be done except try the strength of the other side and the strongest side won. As far as Kalein was concerned, the society was the strongest side. Gordon believed that the dispute had done a great deal of good because the employers in Ungan and Cookstown would realise that the society was fairly strong and be able to, to fight a, a, fought a strong battle and at the end win. And as a result of this, the workers' union organised themselves with textile workers in the two main mills in Ungannon and in Cookstown and secure better wages. By 1918, this then goes in to a wave of strikes in smaller plants and amongst uh, agricultural labourers, and the workers' union recruit thousands of agricultural labourers across the room. It's also the beginnings of uh, attempts to create closed shops. Okay? This, the, typically, the, the best example of this is in Brown Soap Work in Donnett Moor, and I'm not going into the details of it because I see Jared looking at me, quite concerned. So what we'll, we'll do is we look at this is Sam Kyle, Dawson Gordon and Sam Kyle organised the first, and I think only, May Day demonstration in Dungannon. 
Okay? And they say this is the first, but it will not be the last. But this is 1919, and it's definitely the last. Okay? And Sam Cade says they were not there as Bolsheviks or Sinn Feiners, they were there as workers and laborers, first and last. Some people said the demonstration was organized as a Sinn Fein demonstration, but he denied that that was so. It stood as workers and workers alone. They wanted to make this world a place fit for heroes and safe for democracy. What had the governing classes offered those of them who offered their services in the late war? An unemployment dole, laughter. They of the working class never brought on war as they were always against it. The war was brought on by 20 men in Europe and the actions of those 20 men brought misery into 20 million homes. If the working class could get control of industry, they would be able to live, to develop their faculties and bring up their children in the proper way. There was no other movement that could emancipate the workers. So this is the Tyrone Courier, no friend of the worker. It estimates there's about three or 400 people involved in this march. There's a workers' union branch in Bimbor, or part of the demonstration. Now, the textile workers' unions, banners, green and gold. So they get challenged, as Sinn Féiners, and this explains Kyle's remarks. But this is the context in which Padre O'Donnell goes to Caledon. It's within the context of very wide widespread labour militancy in Throne in this period. In fact, there's another strike in Donnetmore at Brown Soap Works, the same time as the Caledon lockout. The reason why the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union are involved in Caledon and not the Workers' Union is because uh, of O'Donnell's success in achieving a wage increase for the workers in Monaghan Asylum and the creation of what, what's called the, the Monaghan Soviet. Okay? Now, this is, the, this is the employer's perspective of what happens in Caledon. This person here is Fred Crawford, the very famous gunrunner and essentially the paramilitary link man to the unionist establishment. And, uh, Crawford was a good friend of John Fulton, or as he calls him, Jack Fulton, the owner of the mill. And this is from Crawford's diary in September 1920, a year after the events. And he says, Jack Fulton showed me a letter on Sunday last. It was addressed to his mill manager, threatening him with death. The manager is going to take it to the Roman Catholic curate and tell him that if he has shot every Roman Catholic in the village of Caledon, the place where the works are will be shot and that the first man will be the curate himself, who is the leader of the Sinn Feiners in the district. This is Far Booth. About two years ago, and this is recounting the strike, about two years ago when the war was on and most of the Protestant workmen were out fighting, their places were filled by Roman Catholic workmen. They tried to boycott the Protestant foremen and struck against them. The war by this time was nearing the end and the Fultons closed the mill for a time. As soon as there was enough Protestants to run any department of it, they opened that department, but none of the strikers were taken back. Crawford then, and, uh, when the parish priest, Bob Booth, saw that the game was up, he came whining for lenient treatment. He was told that he had come too late. So long as he thought there was a fair chance of persecuting a Protestant out of the village, he said nothing. But now, when he saw his parishioners leaving and going to Scotland or elsewhere, naturally it was hitting him very hard. He came to ask for these men to be taken back again. So this is, this is the, the employer's analysis of what happens in Caledon. And this is what's presented as the excuse for the lockout and the, the, the breaking up of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union branch in Caledon. Essentially, Fulton had made a promise to servicemen who went to the war. Whenever the war was over, he had to expel the Catholics who had taken the place of these servicemen in order to give our brave boys back their jobs. Okay? The ringleader in the entire thing was Father Booth, the local Catholic priest, and it was an attempt essentially to drive Protestants out of, of Caledon. The problem with this is that the people who went out on strike were a mixture of both Catholics and Protestants, and if we analyse the people who are mentioned in the 1911 census and in the Ulster Town Directory for Caledon in 1910, we would see that there was an equal split of Catholic and Protestant employees in Caledon before the war, and that actually the Gowan brothers, who are the two Catholic workers who are expelled from the strike the, at the start of the strike, are Catholics, yes, but they're ex-servicemen. And James McManamy, the Protestant Union leader in Caledon, the Secretary of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, is a war hero who won a Medal of Honour fighting in the 36th Ultra Division, and he's on the website. So th this is an excuse, this is a ruse in order to facilitate the control uh, of the mill and to keep wages down. And it's actually a case study in uh, what happens across Ulster after 1919 and in the 1920. It's a precursor really to the tactics that are employed to break this labour militancy within the province. This is what Fulton says about the priest. If he had come when the strike began and told his people that their claims were unjust and unreasonable and had insisted on them going back to their work, then at some lenient treatment or concession, but he did not do so. 
This was put plainly to him, and when asked why he did not take that course, which he could have done, his people would have, been, have taken his advice, or to put it more correctly, his commands. So these are, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the spiritual leader, the Catholic priest, you know, controlling his flock from some sort of machinations of Rome. In fact, the strike was organised by this man, who himself was no friend of the Catholic Church. Father O'Donnell, who, uh, Cahill O'Shannon in The Vice of Labour, says, blaze the trail of glory clean across Ulster through his activism. And he's essentially almost solely responsible for any of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union branches that take place in Ulster. And we don't have time to go into the Monaghan Soviet. But the reason why he's really successful is because rather, and a lot of the details of this come from the very, the interview he gives a uh, University College Galway called Monkeys in the Superstructure. And I don't think Potter believed in monkeys in the superstructure. He, he took the advice of a Balnaw plumber. Uh, he advised me to talk to people in terms of their own experience. And this is why he was successful, first of all, in Monaghan, where most Willie Herr was an orange man, and most of the workers in the asylum were Protestants and orange men. And it's because of his success in Monaghan that he's invited to Caledon. And he comes to Caledon at the behest of a mixed workforce, but primarily members of the one of the three local orange lodges, to try and improve their paying conditions. Now, the Armour Guardian, this is straight from Mary McVeigh, uh, says that almost every night the strikers parade through the streets headed by bonds following the red flag. The voice of Labour, which is obviously biased in O'Donnell's favour, claimed that enthusiasm is at fever pitch with National Union of Railway men cooperating because of the railway line that comes through. Uh, a citizen police force and the orange bond parades and cheers for the transport. Now, this is what the uh, happened O'Donnell. First of all, he lands on the, the, the Tlaher Valley Railway and the people are that excited that they knock him down, trample all over the top of him and knock him out. And he has to be taken to the Charlemagne Hotel in Armagh, revived, and then he's informed that he has to go back. He's not too keen on going back, but he decides that he has to go back. And he meets at what he calls the big tree. And he says there was a tree with a big veranda of cement around it. And I think there's a replacement that, at the foot of the village. They couldn't take a hall. They weren't allowed to have premises. There were men in that town that sold tea and bread and butter and sugar and tobacco, flour and whiskey, and men who sold cloth, who all lived on a fairly decent level. There were other fellows with, who only had their sweat to sell, and they did not seem to sell it as well as the others. They were the ones that I wanted to organise and make demands on. And this is why there's cross-religious uh, working class agitation throughout the room, because the rural proletariat, if you want to call them that, recognise their own material conditions. He says, we discovered that we had the Lambeg drum on our side. We had a man called Willie Harlock, and if you go into the census record, it's really William Harlock, and he's uh, a brother, I think, of two, or, oh yeah, a brother and two sisters work in the mill. He's actually an agricultural labourer. And I remember him making a speech. He said, I am an orange man, and I am a black man. We cheered him like a parish priest. And I am an apprentice boy from Derry. And that was almost as good as a vision for converting people. Okay? Now, we formed a big branch of the Transport Union. It was grand until the Ulster Unionist Labour Association. It was actually uh, strong and in conjunction with William Coote and Fulton. Got the big drums and the full forces of reaction out against me. Quite a number of the workers seceded from the union, but I paraded the streets of that town, Caledon, for six weeks. Oh. Well... It would be worth actually looking at this and I'd curtail maybe the, the latter part of the talk. This is Father Don writing in the Vice of Labour at the time. He said, in South Tyrone, in a town where the majority of workers are Protestant, we have a mighty red flag procession. No surrender emblazoned on one side of the flag, up the Irish transport on the other. The flag that thus can unite our Irish workers is the flag we want. And I don't let the hoisting of it in strikes be, or, and don't let the hoisting of it in strikes be left so much to me. This is an invocation to try and look at the orange ideology of Protestant workers and to try and take the, li the libertarian and take the progressive elements out of it and make common cause with them. And as a proud throw on, I think if we're talking about redesigning the Irish flag, that a red hand <laughs> would be a fine <laughs> new flag for the country. Because it will include the Irish Transport and General Workers Union and obviously the best county and throne as well. So, but the, the point here is that there is then a consolidated campaign against the union. Fulton closes the 
he kicks out the two going brothers. So when they were going, over two thirds of the workers go with them. They leave a rump of about 50 or 60 people in the mill. Fulton closes the mill down and then gradually readmits on a sectarian basis and uses the premise of involvement in the war as his excuse. And then you get some very lurid details in Parliament. So this is William Coote, who owns his own woolen mill up in Balagali, or on the way to Balagali, but doesn't play any Celtic workers at all. He asked McPherson, the, the Under Secretary, was he aware that the Irish Transport Union, a Sinn Féin organisation, recently started a branch of their union in Calden County Throne, recruiting to their ranks the majority of the workers of the Calden Woolen Mills Limited, who are of the same political faith. So he's, either he's saying that there are no Protestants involved, or he's acknowledging that these Protestants are uh, socialists. That they then proceeded to call out the workers unless every employee in the mill joined their union, and that having taken out the majority of the workers, they commenced to beat with hurleys and sticks, and otherwise abused the 53 workers who remained, that a force of police under the command of District Inspector Bain was forced to come. So I don't know whether Willie Horlock and James McManamy had hurley sticks, but I would suggest that it was highly unlikely that hurling sticks were involved, okay? Unless they went down to Mid Middletown and, and got them. I got many a hurling stick across my, in Middletown. So uh, the Coote then writes to the Belfast Telegraph and he says that Sinn Féin was attempting through Ulster by rearguard subtle action to do what it could not do by frontal attack. These destroy Protestant industries and drive out Protestant workers from Ulster. If in this enterprise they can detach a Protestant or better still an orange man to their side, they are delighted. They use him for the time as a decoy and they at once make him an official to do their dirty work and then leave him as they left our orange friend at Caledon and as they left after an eight week fight in which all the most abominable and savage practices were performed, their own Roman Catholic co-religionists, to starve that should be in the streets or clear out having withdrawn all funds of their support. So essentially what happens is forced with starvation or emigration, about two thirds of the Protestant workers go back, okay? But this is after about two months of what appears to be quite considerable solidarity. O'Donnell says, I paraded behind the Union Jack at the start, to the tune of the Boyne Water and Derry's Walls. Gradually the Union Jacks gave way and the red flags took their place. But it ended up with 47 Protestant workers from Caledon taking the train and going across to Yorkshire. They wouldn't desert the Transport Workers Union. So about a third of the Protestants who were members of the Union refused to take Fulton's offer and go back to work and they actually went and worked in woolen mills in Yorkshire and there's reports that they sung the red flag on the way down to the train. Not a very successful strike but a demonstration of serious uh, working class solidarity. Is in the wake of the strike then Fulton holds a celebration, he calls it Calvin's double celebration, overthrow of the Hun and the Irish Bolshevik and Fulton in his speech Thank the local people who had come forward to take the place of the strikers and also the outside sympathisers who gave their moral support. And in this respect, he's talking about the leadership of, old, of the Old Town Hall in Belfast, the Ulster Unionist Party, and the, the leader members of the local Orange Order. And the Orange Order issues a statement decrying their members who have went out on the strike and saying they've never given them any material support. Okay. After the strike then, Fulton, quite vindictively then, kicks strikers out of the houses that are rented uh, as, as part of the tenancy agreement. There's a one-week rent if you work in the mill. Okay? And he kicks James McManamy out. He also kicks Margaret Downey out. And Margaret Downey's son-in-law was an ex-service man who worked in the mill. And he's kicked out as well. So here was a Protestant who served in the war with such distinction that he won the military medal. And because he objected to work for six shillings a week, he is evicted, together with his mother. One does not wonder that my enemy should tell the court he was sorry he threw himself in the way of some of the Germans getting over. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm conscious we don't have an awful lot of time. How much time do we have? We're William scratching the hang in your hand. <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep her lit. I'll keep her lit. Okay. So, what, what does this... So, rather than just focusing on Calvin, we perhaps should kind of bring the lens back and see that Calvin is actually a small element in something far more general that's happening. And it's happening in response, first of all, to the general strike in Belfast in January 1919, in which 60,000 workers are involved. Now, these are not 60,000 socialists, okay? These are not 60,000 revolutionaries, 
All right. There are, uh, there are members of the Ulster Unionist Labour Association here. Very few of them are involved in the strike committee. There are also people who are out for improved economic conditions. But the, the people who lead the strike in the strike committee, in the words of people like Dawson Bates, who continually writes the caution during the strike, these people he calls Sinn Feiners forward slash Bolshevich. Now, this doesn't reflect reality of what these people's ideological position were. First of all, they weren't Sinn Feiners. Some of them might have had admiration for the Bolsheviks. But they were actually socialists who were intent on trying to mobilise Catholics and Protestants in Belfast and across Ulster. Now, they, this is a queue of Roman Catholic families in Dublin after the, the pogrom. But this is a letter from Bates to Carson in February 1919 at the height of the strike. And he says it is Im re really important that we get the decent men to secede from the Sinn Féin Bolshevik element. Now, the Sinn Féin Bolshevik element are about the quarter of working class Protestants in Belfast who vote for Kyle and Gordon and these people who are prepared to break with a uh, unionist hegemony. So in 1919, the workers are in a strong position. There's a strike amongst shipyard and engineering workers who are the most unionist workers in Belfast. So we don't pretend that this general strike was you know, somehow the beginnings of some sort of frustrated socialist revolution. But what we can say is that by January 1920, the people who led the strike and the chief movers in the strike is the Belfast Labour Party have garnered an awful lot of support amongst the Protestant working class. Someone like Sam Kyle tops the poll in the Shankill Road. Okay? There were more socialist republicans on the Shankill Road in 1920 than on the Falls Road. Think about it like that. On the Falls Road they were all voting for Joe Devlin. On the Shankill Road, a significant amount of working class Protestants were voting. Now, what happens this is, is that the unionist establishment clearly view this as far greater threat than republicanism. Republicanism and nationalism, they can deal with. Okay? These people, they f find it a, a lot harder to deal with. And this in ma very many respects. And if you look at the correspondence between Bates and Carson and Craig, and you look at the way that they operate this, they essential, the, the, the ingredients for the pogrom or their from the beginning of 1920. Okay? There's a remobilization of the UVF, there's the uh, Ulster Protestant Association, there's the Imperial Guard, and there are moves towards what could be compared to paramilitary right wing activity in somewhere like Germany after the Second World War. You have the ex service, the, 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 the Ulster ex service men's association as well is particularly important. So Carson, although he describes Orange speeches as the unrolling of a mummy, all rotten bones and old rags, doesn't balk at giving them. And he talks at Finnehy on the 12th of 1920, these men who come forward posing as the friends of labour care no more about labour than does the man in the moon. Their real object is that they mislead and bring about disunity among our people. And in the end, before we know where we are, we find ourselves in the same bondage and slavery as the rest of Ireland in the south and west. And he finishes his speech, and these are not mere words, he urged, I'm sick of words without action. Okay? Now a series of, of, of events then leads to the expulsion of 10,000 Catholics and, well, we could actually probably say up to a thousand what are called rotten prods or trade unionists. In fact, anybody who was independently involved in the strike is expelled from the shipyard and the en engineering works. Okay? The, there's a row in Belfast City Hall, and uh, we are not worry too much about that. But the, the key thing here is that the expulsions were as much, if not more, about breaking the Belfast Labour Party and the labour movement in Belfast as they were about expelling Catholics. Quite clearly, if you look at the private correspondence within Old Town Hall and, and, and Union's bigwigs, this is what it was about. What does it mean? It means that 23,000 people were driven from their homes in Belfast, while approximately 50,000 people fled the Six County Territory because of intimidation. Over the next two years, 500 people are killed in Belfast. 60% of them Catholic in a city that's 25% Catholic. So you're about seven times more likely to be killed if you're a Catholic. You can't see this, but Carson then says in Parliament, I am prouder of my friends in the shipyards than of any other friends I have in the whole world. So they take over the shipyards, they institute vigilance committees, and you can only get uh, work back in the shipyards if you sign a loyalty pledge. So they, they essentially create the framework for the material conditions of the Orange State in the summer of 1920. And, th and th th this is, if it's not, fully fascist, it's, it's proto-fascist in the way that it's set up. 
And the, the a man who's very familiar with fascism, because he had plenty of cups of tea in Berkeley's garden with Hitler, Lloyd George, he, he sees the similarities. Now, the, the really incredible thing about this is that the Imperial Guards and the ex Servicemen's Association and the Ulster Protestants Association, after they expel Catholics and Socialists, and well, Catholic Socialists, Socialist Catholics, whatever label you want to use, after they expel them, the British government then turned them into the Ulster Special Constabulary in September 1920. They become the paramilitary police force of the new Orange State. And the British government financed them over the next two years to the tune of six million pounds. Why? Because this provides employment in a, in a post-war economic, a delayed post-war economic downturn for ex-servicemen and it consolidates loyalty to the new six county state. In May 1922, Lloyd George claimed that Mussolini's fascisti served as an exact analogy for the Ulster Specials and that unlike the Free State, the North was not a dominion. He then claimed that the initial attack and brunt of subsequent violence involved the murder of members of the Catholic minority, while we had armed 48,000 Protestants. Okay? So, th this is ordinary people's lives being wrought and destroyed at the level of high politics, in a quite cynical way, by people in London who understand exactly what they're doing. What are the implications of this in Calvin? And I'll finish with this. This is the street that they used to march up and down with no surrender on a red banner. On the 8th of February 1922, the IRA actually kidnapped leading unionists in the Tlaher Valley. Okay? The Free State Army then sets up a machine gun post at Bala Bridge. I don't know where Bala Bridge is. Does anyone from here know where? Oh, yeah. Two miles out the road. So the, the specials. Yeah, so, so Glasslock and Callan are really important in this story, and it'll be a really quick story. All right, so the Free State Army, you know that border we're hearing a lot about? So the, 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 there was a checkpoint on it. There was <laughs> the, the specials were looking to get rid of the bridge because of the kidnapping of leading unionists, okay? The Free State Army weren't prepared to let them do it, so they fired on them when they were doing it, and they actually killed the Protestant farmer, an innocent civilian, doing this, okay? There was then a rumour... So Fulton hears about this and he writes to his mate, Dawson Bates, in February 1922, possibly there will be serious reprisals in this town and district tonight, as naturally our people cannot and will not put up with actions of this kind from the other side. Have extra police drafted into this town without further delay, as those in responsible positions cannot guarantee that the peace will be kept. A. John Fulton complaining about the sectarian tension after he's created an enormous amount of sectarian tension in Caledon. What happens in Caledon is, uh, first of all, uh, on the 12th of March 1922, the, spe the specials do a drive-by shooting of Henry Maguire's house, which is out uh, right there. On the 14th of March, three men standing at a street corner after leaving the chapel are blown up by a bomb. A, a special constable throws a bomb in amongst them. On the 15th of March, B specials shoot John Harvey and Patrick McPhillips in Bimburb, and this sets off two weeks of intimidation. Now, the argument here is that there has been expulsions. The Free State Army has expelled Protestants from Glasslock. And this is in retaliation to expulsions from Glasslock. Okay? At, at 5 pm on the 18th of March 1922, lorries filled with armed men arrived, placed pickets outside houses, and proceeded to load the furniture onto the lorries. All five families are identified with Sinn Fein in some way, and their eviction is thought to be a reprisal for the eviction of five Protestant families from their house in Glasslock. Okay? No action was taken by the police because the police were doing the evicting. Okay, if proceedings were instituted at present, it would have the effect of increasing party bitterness. Okay, so essentially, well, now, Colonel Sutton of the, not the Boundary Commission, the Border Commission, which is set up because of this violence, investigates it, and he finds out actually that the story about last lock was only partially true. The IRA had seized the Orange Hall and used it as a base, but two Protestants there who were involved in these shootings, one of them, Elliot, uh, was particularly prominent, had come into Caledon and spread the story that they had been expelled and then taken part in a lot of this violence. But what we get uh, is, this is uh, Fulton again writing later on, and he says, Fulton then proceeded the normal proviso, unless something is done without further delay, a very state of, serious state of affairs may arise, as the people cannot stand this long and will not be responsible for their actions to local Sinn Féiners or Roman Catholics. I assure you, we who are responsible, now he means moderate and good, but he's actually responsible partly for what's happening in Caledon here, are using our best endeavour to have the peace kept.
but things have got now to almost breaking point. They may blaze up at, a, at any moment. So the, the, the story of the Caledon lockout is actually an incredibly sad story in the end. You get a village where 200, about 250, 260 people, evenly spread between Catholics and Protestants, marched up and down the street demanding better paying conditions and union recognition, where their identity as orange men or as Catholics or as Hibernians were reflected in their union flag, and where actually the employer, for very cynical and selfish reasons, played the orange card and introduced sectarianism, broke the strike in the same village three, what, less than three years later. Two years later, you have people throwing bombs into the chapel and you have people getting evicted. You have the IRA kidnapping people. You have people or innocent Protestant farmers getting shot in their field at a bridge. So you can see that the, the, the I don't want you to all leave here sort of incredibly pessimistic, <laughs> but we can see, we have to understand the mechanics of the counter-revolution, of the way that it was achieved. And that's why I finish with labor, must labour wait. There was, there was potential during this period for a far more consolidated working class revolution. Okay? Uh, people talk about the democratic program, and I gave a talk down in Dublin a few weeks ago about the democratic program. And the democratic program is an incredible document. If you read it, it talks about all the rights of private property must be subordinated to the public right and welfare, natural resources and wealth and the interest and for the benefit of the Irish people, state provision of education for children and care for the elderly, industry, progressive cooperative and industrial lines, ensuring that children receive food, adequate share at the produce of the nation's labour. And this is endorsed through votes for Labour and Sinn Féin in January and in June 1920. So the Irish people have voted for this. The unfortunate thing is, is that whenever the pogrom takes place in Belfast and the Sinn Féin Dáil government go to discuss it, De Valera has to give out copies of the democratic programme to his ministers because they've never read it. All right? So what was this? So an Ulster Protestant Sinn Féin or William Forbes Patterson wrote a report in 1920, before the expulsions, and he predicted the expulsions. And he says that Sinn Féin can achieve a foothold in Ulster if they make, if they make an appeal to the members of the Protestant working class who are not unionist. They're not Sinn Féiners. They don't you know, have no interest in sort of uh, that Gaelicized type of romantic nationalism. They're nothing. But they can be convinced about civ the civic nation, being members of a civic nation and being Republican and being socialist. And Patterson says, the democratic program is the framework to try and split the unionist hegemony and to create something better in Ulster. And it's ignored. In fact, as I said, members of the Dáil cabinet hadn't even read it. This is in the context where someone like Dawson Gordon has increased the membership of the Irish Textile Federation from 400 in 1914 to 40,000 in 1919. Okay? Now, they, they don't suggest that these people are all red revolutionaries. But they're not unionists. They're not partitionists. Father O'Donnell says that we lost out in 1921 because there was no way day-to-day -day struggle making for differentiation so that in those days we were forced to defend ranches, enforce rents and be neutral in strikes. And he's talking about he leaves from Derry, he gets involved in the Derry Trade Council, he tries to spread the Irish Transport and General Workers Union in Derry, meets a lot of opposition and then he just goes straight into the IRA. Because he said, there was, he, and you read his recollection, he says there was no avenue for labour militancy within the, the National Revolution. And he goes and joins the Ra's, as they're called. Okay? So he says the free state was in existence long before the name was adopted. And this is what we get then. We get the carnival reaction. We get a free state counter-revolution. And I showed this slide in Dublin. This is a house in Waterford yeah, in 1922. This is someone's home. Kevin O'Higgins, who's the leading member of the, of the Common and Yale Free State Government, claimed the democratic programme was mostly poetry. Patrick McGilligan, a fellow public school educated, uh, uh, Blow's uh, alumni, who's also a minister, says, it is not the function of the doll to provide work, and the sooner this is realised, the better. People may have to die in this country of starvation. Okay? And they did. So, the... the Critique and 
This is the really ironic thing about Caledon, is that in October, November 1919, after the people, after the strike has been broken, after people have left, Joe Devlin and the Hibernians arrive and try to capitalise on the situation to make a point about unionist intransigence. But Joe Devlin and the Hibernians had stood against trade unionism in Ireland. They'd, been, they'd sent scabs down to Dublin against the, the workers during the 1913 lockout. It was pure opportunism. And that type of very anti-nationalism cannot confront unionism. So th- this is, and I am definitely finished now. So what, don't be even pessimistic because there's, there's several things that Caledon shows. A better world is possible. That entranced, entrenched positions, the other, I come from a community where I didn't know any Protestants until I went to university, where I was told not to walk on the eastern side of Dungannon, because, you know, make it your head beaten. Okay? That the other was, you know, how can you understand anyone if you don't speak to them or you have nothing to do with them? But Caledon wasn't always like that. This place wasn't always like that. Before the First World War, Caledon Woolmill had a mixed workforce. A lot, an equal proportion of Catholics and Protestants volunteered in the First World War. Okay? Caledon was a mixed village. It was predominantly Protestant. The Orange Order was very strong in it, but Catholics and Protestants mixed together quite well. The nature of the counter-revolution that happened in the North and the South in 19, between 1921 and 1923, institutionalised and embedded sectarianism within the fabric of Irish society. And the constitutional setup that is involved in Ireland at the minute, no matter what you think of it, is based on a sectarian conception of who Irish people are. It's based on an ethnic or sectarian type of nationalism. There's a Catholic nation, I don't know what the Pope thinks of that, I thought it was an international organisation, but the ideas of civic nationalism, that there's a civic nation based on universal rights, which was the ideas of Wolf's tone and republicanism, have been lost even by people who claim to be republican. So th- this, you're going to get here an awful lot of talk. Now, I would suggest that we're, we're in for a lot of green flaggery. When Leo Varadkar is painting himself as you know, an Irish nationalist and sticking it to the Brits, you might uh, need some sort of yardstick to try and work out what type of nationalism. If it's Catholic nationalism, or it's Hibernianism, it's not going to attract anybody, and it's going to serve the interests of the most powerful people in Ireland. So that's why I put Connolly up, and that's the, the children who spent the, their night in the, the Garda station in Dublin. He says, Ireland without her people is nothing to me, and the man who is bubbling over with love and enthusiasm for Ireland, and can yet pass and move through our streets and witness all the wrong, and the suffering, the shame, and the degradation wrought upon the people of Ireland, I wrought by Irishmen upon Irishmen and women, without burning to end it, is, in my opinion, a fraud and a liar in his heart. No matter how he loves that combination of chemical elements which he is pleased to call Ireland. So the, what do we learn from Gallatin? I was at a, the unveiling of a statue to James Connolly two years ago, the unveiling of a statue to, of a man who said, never erect a statue to me. And Connolly says, we can't recreate the, the socio-economic conditions and the political conditions of 100 years ago, but we're now entering a period, particularly after 2008, where we're in a flux, where we, 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 we've come to a generational breaking point in terms of politics, where there are no possibilities to create a better future, where a better world is possible. Do we continually cast our eye back to the past, or do we take the lessons from the past and take Connolly's advice and say, we who hold his principles, he's talking about Tone, but we could equally be talking about Connolly. Cherish his memory all the more on that account, believing as we do that any movement which would successfully grapple with the problem of national freedom must draw its inspiration not from the smouldering, the smouldering that should be records of a buried past, but from the glowing hopes of the living present and the vast possibilities of the mighty future. Gurmag. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>